when there are bishops in dioceses, the church is very well constructed. And that's for the good of the church. In these dioceses, you have one bishop, and within that diocese, they have various parishes. Their territorial area is very clearly delineated. And in those parishes, there's a pastor. <clears throat> in moral theology, the question is raised whether a priest, uh, what under, under what obligation does a pastor, that means the bishop of the diocese or pastor of his parish, what is his obligation to, to administer the sacraments? It says in moral theology he has an obligation in justice. He's the pastor. He's supported by his parish or he's supported by the diocese. Even in time of plague, when people are dying, pastor has to be there. He can't just abandon his flock. Okay. What if, what is the obligation of those who are not pastors? When there is no pastors available, what are other priests' obligation? You see, within the church, there are some priests who are pastors and some priests who are priests, valley ordained priests in the Catholic Church, but they don't have a parish. They might be working in a seminary, working at a school, working in the chancellery office. A lot of different things priests can do, not necessarily involving being a pastor with jurisdiction over a parish. Priests who do not have pastoral care have an obligation to administer the sacraments in charity. St. Alfonso Liguori poses this question. <clears throat> if a priest without jurisdiction or faculties, begins to hear confessions, does he commit a mortal sin, venial sin, or no sin at all if he's doing that? St. Alphonsus Liguri says, if the pastor or those with jurisdiction are nearby and the priest goes into confession, starts hearing confessions, and forces what we call supply jurisdiction, if there's no reason for that, he commits a mortal sin. However, if a priest finds that the pastor is not there, the pastor died, he's sick, he's incapacitated, it's a holy day of obligation, there's people who want to go to confession. St. Alphonsus Liguori teaches that a priest who operates on supply jurisdiction commits no sin whatsoever. And St. Alphonsus Liguori lists all these different situations by which even though a priest may not be a pastor, he still has the obligation to hear confessions for the good of the church, for the good of souls. What do we mean by supply jurisdiction? Well, first of all, pastors and uh, parishes and dioceses uh, that were bishops, diocesan bishops, pastors of parishes have what we call ordinary jurisdiction. It comes with their office. Now they can subdivide. They can, they could, uh, you know, subdelegate. I should say not subdivide. Subdelegate to others their jurisdiction. So there's ordinary jurisdiction, there's delegated, and then there finally is supply jurisdiction. This concept of supply jurisdiction is very clearly taught in canon law, canon 209, because the sacraments are for the people. In fact, it says in canon law, canon 2261, even if someone was excommunicated, as long as it has not been declared excommunicated, the faithful, especially if there's no one else to give the sacraments, can petition the sacraments from such priests because the sacraments are for the people. So this idea that, oh, you don't have any jurisdiction, I can't go to your mass, I can't receive sacraments from you, those who are what we call home aloners, very, very sad. Other issue with regard to jurisdiction, when it comes to the consecration of bishops, in normal times, normal times, <clears throat> when a bishop's consecrated, he has to be nominated and given a mandate from the Pope. However, we are not in normal times. There has not been a pope since Vatican II. Some people say, well, then there can't be any more consecration of bishops. You've got to get the pope's permission. Sorry, you've got to, got to wait for a pope. It's not true. There were bishops consecrated in a time of no pope or interregnum. There were some, I think, 20-something pope, or excuse me, 20-something um, bishops consecrated in different dioceses, and this was in the 1200s when there was no pope. There was a, a period of three years vacancy. That was between Pope Clement IV, November 29th, 1268, to the election of Blessed Gregory X, September 1st, 
1271. There were 21 vacancies in various dioceses. These bishops were consecrated without a papal mandate to fill the vacancies in these different dioceses for the spiritual necessity of the faithful. And there was an impossibility of getting the papal mandate. And when Pope Gregory X came to reign, he said, no problem with those consecrations. Those bishops had jurisdiction. They could do everything they needed to do for the good of the faithful. We also have <clears throat> another issue that comes up sometimes, and that is under Pope Pius XII, and this is a, a very tragic situation in China, the communist Chinese were trying to establish a, a Chinese quote-unquote Catholic church. They realized they could use religion as a means of controlling their people. And so in the 1950s, the communist Chinese government were forcing bishops to ordain and consecrate men for this Chinese church. Pope Pius XII, he said that this is, you know, he identified the problems in China, that they're establishing a new schismatic church. And he basically wanted to say, we're not talking about dioceses that are vacant. There's no bishop there. These bishops, these Catholic bishops are still there. The communist intention is for these people to break with the Catholic Church and break with the, the Pope. And so this is what the Pope said. Consequently, if consecrations of this kind is being done contrary to all right and law, and by this crime the unity of the Church is being severely attacked, an excommunication reserved, especially lissimo modo, to the apostolics, apostolics he has been established. Now there is a canon, and this is talking about the interpretation of laws. You know, sometimes people, and I don't know if you get on the Internet, some people all overnight canon lawyers, and they're jumping to this canon, jumping to that canon. Before they even get into canon law, they should study the first so many canons that tell you how to interpret canon law. First of all, what are the, what's the purpose of the church's laws? Pope Pius XII, addressing these clerical students in Rome, said, the ultimate purpose of all the laws of the church are to get people to heaven, the salvation of souls. The church's laws are to organize the church of Christ and facilitate the salvation of souls. That's bottom line. In canon law, it says that a law, if it becomes detrimental to the salvation of souls, it ceases to be a law. But when it comes to penalties, you interpret that law strictly, meaning if the person has not committed that crime exactly according to the law, there's no crime. There's no penalty. And that's where people get very, very confused. There was one, I won't say his name, uh, one man that's a home aloner saying that can of law says it's, it, penalties are to be strictly interpreted. And he completely has the opposite interpretation. Strictly means nail them, hit them hard, and let them have it. And that's not what it says. It says, in the, the Latin phrase is, in penis, in penalties, benignior interpretatio. In penalties, a more benign interpretation. Now, what was Pope Pius XII saying about this excommunication? If consecrations of this kind, what, like in China, where they're trying to usurp the power of the Pope, establish their own schismatic church, being done contrary to all right and law, and a crime against the unity of the church is being seriously you know, committed, excommunication is attached. Is that the same as the situation today? When Bishop Took did the consecration of Bishop Carmona and Bishop Gerardo Laurier and Bishop Zamora, he was certainly not trying to establish a schematic church. Bishop Took realized that he was a true Catholic bishop. He realized the apostasy that was before him, and he realized without true bishops, there would be no true priests, without true, no, without true priests, there would be no mass and valid sacraments. Bishop Took made a public statement to the effect. That's why he's doing what he's doing, because John Paul II is not a pope. He's, 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 he's worshiping with other religions, false ecumenism, a new mass, new sacraments, all those things. So when it comes to jurisdiction, when it comes to consecration of bishops, 
It's already been done. Bishops were consecrated without papal mandate when there was no pope during the time of interregnum. And it's not contrary to the law. The, the main thing is this. The laws of the church are for the salvation of souls. And that's where people go radically wrong and paint themselves in a corner because they're trying to interpret these laws. And this is the important thing. With this idea of intrinsic cessation of law, where if a law is impossible to follow, you don't have to follow it. It's right there in canon law. It's saying the, the, the legislator, the pope, he cannot possibly make a law for every single situation that comes up. It's impossible. And so if something, a, a situation, a change of circumstances occurs and the law is against the common good, it's no longer a law that has to be followed. There is a, a term in law which is called epikaya. It's a benign interpretation of the law according to the mind of the law, legislator and against the strict letter of the law. This is not something we're making up. St. Thomas Aquinas speaks about this. In all the books on canon law, they talk about epikaya, interpretation of law, intrinsic cessation of law. But some of these people out there, like the Pharisees, they're waiting for a law that says, okay, when there's no pope, and there's been a long interregnum, and, and the apostasy is a taking place, then you can do this. Well, you're not going to find a law like that because no one could have foreseen what we're living in today. I also wanted to say, too, when you look at the very purpose of law, a law is an ordinance of right reason made for the common good. A law has to be possible, just, reasonable. And what is the purpose of the law? For our salvation. These people are interpreting the laws against our salvation. Saying, oh, you can't consecrate any bishops, just got to stay home, baptize your kids, make an act of contrition, wear your scapular, and hope for the best. That's, if that's what you believe, then the gates of hell have prevailed against the church, that the church is dead. Some of these people don't believe there's a hierarchy left. When Jesus said, I am with you all days, even to the end of the world, he's talking to the apostles and their successors. The apostles were not going to live forever, he was talking about the apostles and their successors. There always has to be bishops within the church. The church is one holy Catholic apostolic. So the other thing that comes up, uh, just wanted to share this with you. As you know, the Society of St. Pius X, they basically have the position of recognize these men as pope, but then disobey them. Accept what's good, reject what's bad. But what they end up doing is they become their own authority on the man that they say is the Pope. Well, that's, that's good work, except that, no, that's heresy. We don't go for that. Now, I'm going to read to you from this magazine called 30 Days. This is the article that came out right after uh, Archbishop Lefebvre did the consecrations, July 1988, interview with Archbishop Lefebvre. Now, what do you foresee will be the future of the fraternity, SSPX, and its relationships with the Church of Rome, Lefebvre? I hope that within a few years, four or five at most, Rome will end up coming to an agreement with us. I am convinced that we are now have, a, have more influence on Rome because we are keeping our organization intact, strong and well-organized, and we're more valid discussion partners than if we accepted the accord that they proposed to us. And if this doesn't happen... Lefebvre, Rome would remain far from tradition and it would be the end of the church. Since I recognize in the Pope the successor of Peter, I am not one who considers the see of Peter vacant. And listen to this. I do not say that this Pope is a heretic, but his ideas are heretical. And they have already read, been condemned by previous pontiffs and lead to heresy. What kind of talk is that? He's not a heretic, but his ideas are heretical. Well, I think that's pretty much what heretics are. They have heretical ideas. But you know, this is the reason why there's two different groups in the Society of St. Pius X. Bishop Williamson has left the Society of St. Pius X. He has this, what's called the resistance. They say they're the Pius X of the strict observance, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is interesting because Archbishop Lefebvre, 1976, he was suspended by Paul VI. What is a suspension? Well, there's three penalties in the church. 
excommunication, you're kicked out of the church. You're in big trouble, you're out. You're not, you're outside the church. Interdict. Let's say, hypothetically, that all the kids here at St. Michael's Academy revolted against the teachers and whatever. Uh, and the sisters locked themselves in the, in the cloister and are calling Omaha for help. <laughs> and then I'd get on the phone and tell Father Casmer and Father um, Bernard, don't give any of the kids the sacraments. The whole place is on interdict. No, nobody gets the sacraments. Lock the doors of the church. There's no mass, no confessions, nothing. Okay? Maybe at best we'll baptize the kids out in front of the mount uh, somewhere by the steps. But that's it. That's interdict. Uh, maybe a bad analogy. Kids won't get an idea about that. Okay. <laughs> the third thing is, the third thing is suspension. Meaning if a priest does something scandalous or gets in trouble, he's forbidden to exercise his priestly functions. So this happened to Archbishop Lefebvre in 1976 because he was ordaining priests to offer the Latin Mass, which was back then no good, forbidden, can't do it. So what did Archbishop Lefebvre say? He's saying, you know, I'm going to read right from this. What could be clear? We must henceforth obey and be faithful to the conciliar church, no longer to the Catholic Church. Right there is the whole problem. We are suspended ad divinis by the conciliar church and for the conciliar church to which we, we have no wish to belong. That conciliar church is a schismatic church because it breaks what the Catholic Church has always been. It has new dogmas, new priesthood, new institutions, new worship already condemned by the church and many a document official and definitive. And we're going to get right to the point here. The church that affirms such errors is at once schismatic and heretical. This conciliar church, therefore, is not Catholic. To whatever extent pope, bishops, priests, and faithful adhere to this new church, they separate themselves from the Catholic church. Sounds pretty good to me, but if we take his other article here, his interview with 30 Days magazine, he's writing to John Paul II, and he says, I, I recognize you as a legitimate pope. And he says, I, I regarded the mass, the Novus Ordo was a, a valid mass. It's, I never said it's an invalid or heretical. And we, we accept Vatican II in light of tradition. And Holy Father, accept my feelings of profound and filial respect, etc. Writing to a cardinal, he says, if my words and some of my acts are disapproved by the Holy See, I'm very sorry. Uh, and then he talks about, I subscribe you know, I accept Vatican II in light of tradition. And he says that, uh, you know, hoping that Holy Father will not wish to put, does not wish to put in doubt our attachment to the Catholic and Roman Church and successor of St. Peter, Archbishop Lefebvre vacillated. He, he, uh, he'd talk a hard line. These aren't, this is not Catholic. This is heretical. The new code of canon law, the canon 843 on giving communion to non-Catholics, Archbishop Lefebvre said, that's heretical. That's absolutely heretical. And yet, at the end of his letter, saying that his heresy, he said, kneeling at your feet, Holy Father, begging your blessing from a heretic. Who, who promulgated this? John Paul II did. That's the problem today with the Society of St. Pius X. They're saying these men are the popes, and somehow, even though they've taught heresy and they taught erroneous things, they're still the pope. If that be the case, then the gates of hell have prevailed against the church. If, if these men are Peter the Rock, then the gates of hell prevail because they are destroying the church from within. And like I said, it's not even close anymore. Uh, sins against the first commandment, ecumenism, they do it all the time. No big deal. Now they're hitting the sixth and ninth commandment with homosexuality. No big deal. When he was in... Uh, in the United States for his papal mass, there was a notorious homosexual, Mo Rocca, notorious homosexual who was the lector at the mass. And uh, how these things are, go on and nothing said about it. And it gets away with it, there's no big deal. But you know, it just keeps happening, keeps happening, keeps happening, and people are scandalized. I remember um, one of our priests after the priest meeting, Father Gabriel, driving back from Omaha back to Akron, Ohio, he called me up, and I, I didn't get the call, but he left the message. He's saying, I'm listening on national radio. There's a talk show host talking about Francis I and 
what he's saying is so contrary to what the Catholic Church taught in the past. This man's not even a Catholic. He's a Jew. And people are calling in saying, we're in crisis in our faith. How can this man be the head of the church and say the preposterous things that he's saying? So I want to get really uh, quickly to, to the point, and it is very important for us in these times. They're very confusing times. You get on the Internet, there's a lot of different opinions out there, and you could be easily drawn one way or the other. Just remember, Christ's promise. The gates of hell will not prevail against this church. He's with the church all days, even to the consummation of the world. And when Our Lady said, in the end, her immaculate heart will triumph, do I think things are going to be hunky-dory? No. I'm a realist, an optimistic realist, because I know God's in charge. God could do anything. Some people think the reign of Mary's Immaculate Heart is going to be turn on a radio, you're going to hear Gregorian chant, you're going to open up the Spokane Review and you have the lives of the saints and it's going to be all wonderful. No. Jesus says this. You think when the Son of Man comes, second coming, that he's going to find faith on the earth? Do you think he's going to find it? Our Lord tells us these times are going to be really, really bad. The devil will try to deceive even the elect. So in these days of apostasy, let's not underestimate you know, that our Mary, Mary's Immaculate Heart is triumphing now by the fact that the Catholic Church has not been destroyed. That we do have Catholics worldwide who believe the same way, worship the same way, and following the same laws the Catholic Church has held. That is amazing. When I look at and study Vatican II, how clever, absolutely clever, these men were inspired by Satan to very subtly write these things and the way they did it, there's sometimes in the beginning when I study Vatican II, I think I'd have to read this four or five times. And then I say, there's where they went off. Very clever, very subtle. And if you don't read that really carefully, you're not quite sure what they're saying, but you can see it. And not only that, but we know how they interpret it as well. But they were very, very subtle in how they did these things and did it incrementally. Don't hit them all at once. The changes in Vatican II. Remember, I don't know if you ever remember Project Renewal. You hear that in your parishes, Project Renewal, and the changes and taking out the altar rails and putting out, taking out the altars and putting up tables and nuns were in their new habits and everything was going in so many different directions. You didn't know what to think. Didn't know what to think whatsoever. But as we can look back, we can see they were very, very clever how they did this and very subtle. They knew. After a while, the holy clergy are going to die off. We're going to have these modern ones who are very, very uh, infected with false ecumenism and religious indifferentism and modernism. Uh, it's, it's, it, we, we see the reality of this today. I don't know. I don't want to belabor these points, but I remember many YouTubes uh, showing these bishops after their different synods and get-togethers. These bishops are, are waving their hands and dancing around an embarrassment. These are grown men, and you'd think they would know better. And they're, and they're trying to act like teenagers up in front of the altar dancing around. Give me a break. It's, it's sad, very, very sad, but it's, like I say, it makes a mockery of the church. If any of you ever, I'm sure most of you have seen this, but Bergoglio's mass, his children's mass in Buenos Aires, uh, balloon mass, uh, girl there in pants and in a T-shirt and her baseball cap like cheerleader going on, and it was a fiasco, absolute fiasco. And these kids, there's communion being passed out like it's, like it's potato chips. Very, very sad. Bergoglio again with his ecumenical thing around Hanukkah, where he's worshiping with the Jews and these other, other religions of Argentina there all together and doing their thing, etc. These men, especially Francis the first, he isn't hiding what he thinks. The statements he makes are so un-Catholic. Uh, I know you've probably heard this last year, but some of you are new. Around the time of, uh, I think it was December, uh, he gave a talk on our Blessed Mother. And Borgoglio said, Francis I said, when Mary stood at the foot of the cross, she could have looked up at the cross and said, you lied to me, God. You are a liar. You said that he would be you know, sitting on the throne of his father David and he ruled the house of Jacob forever. You lied to me. That's blasphemous. That Mary would tell God that he's a liar? This is, this is just so 
uh, so scandalous and, and so insulting to Our Lady. It, it can't, it, there's no words to describe it. So what's, what's really a challenge for all of us is, is this. It's surreal. There's millions and millions of modern Catholics who have no clue what's going on. They think things are great. They think things are fine. But when we look at things compared to what the faith teaches us, I was talking to Father Casimir, and I was double-checking this. Uh, these are the stats, and these are 10-year-old stats. How many Catholics in the United States are opposed to homosexuality? How many are, are opposed to it? 20%. Father Casimir is just telling me, he said, at a recent poll, 60% of the men, 70% of the women are in favor of homosexual unions in the United States, of Catholics. How many are opposed to abortion? This is 10-year-old stat. 37% are opposed to abortion. Euthanasia, 31% are opposed to euthanasia. This is, these are old stats, but you read in the newspaper when they take these surveys and what have you, so many of these people that call themselves Catholics, they don't believe what the church is teaching. They don't believe it at all. How many people go to church on Sundays worldwide? This is 10 years ago. 38% of Catholics go to church on Sundays. 38%. United States, 44%. Is it any wonder why they're closing churches down? They're closing churches down left and right for financial reasons. They can't keep them open. There's not enough support. I know up in Minneapolis, St. Paul, the, uh, I read this in St. Cloud newspaper, they were closing a number of churches. Why? Because there's not that many people going to church anymore. They have to close these churches and consolidate. And this goes on everywhere. So the fruits are there, the evidence is there, and that's the reason why when our Lord tells us the gates of hell will not prevail, let's not lose hope and think uh, it's hopeless. No, we still have the mass, we have the sacraments, there's still Catholic bishops there. The situation is very dire. It's not very easy without a pope because there are different opinions there. And a pope would settle these different opinions, but without a pope... There are different opinions on any given topic, and that's the reason why it's important for us not to get sucked into these debates and arguments, and it's a waste of time. Uh, I wanted not to uh, neglect having a question and answer period. I know we've, somebody says I talk fast. I'm from Chicago. I talk real fast, okay? And I write, when I'm in a hurry, I write real lousy. Like I said, Sister Mary Juliana, who taught me uh, penmanship, she'd be rolling over in her grave, how ugly my handwriting was on the board, but we're trying to do this very quickly. Are there any questions? Well, the thing he's asking about, why you see the numbers of the, the size of the church growing, and yet on the other hand, this is, the, this is a, I think, a very important thing. It's a fact that in, like, Europe, Catholic families are only having supposedly one kid. And uh, not to get off into another topic, but I was talking to Father Riesling and Father Heine in Germany, they're now accepting or absorbing 800,000 refugees from the Middle East. Uh, he said, we're going to lose our identity as Germans. We're going we're to lose it. There's Catholic churches there, and they had a Catholic culture. That's going to be gone because of birth control and abortion. It's, 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 and same thing in Italy, same thing in France, same thing in England, same thing in Spain. Uh, these Catholic, once Catholic countries, they're, they're going to be absorbed by Muslims who are having large families. And, 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 but insofar as Catholics leaving the church, there have been a tremendous amount of Catholics who have left the church too. So it's kind of hard to understand what these statistics are saying. I, I, I don't know. But are they being converted and accepting the Catholic faith as it was before? I wonder about that. Some of these people might be Protestants, feel comfortable with, well, no difference between the Lutherans and the Catholics, so, you know, I, I, could, I can switch over. Uh, yes? Well, I, I think it's like this. Like I said, and they have the book in the, in the sister's bookstore. It's called the Incaridian Symbolorum. It has a collection of the main teachings of the popes and councils from Clement the First, 90 A.D., all to 1958, Pius XII. And when you read the Pope's teachings, the Council's teachings, it sounds like the same person wrote it. Very clear, very concise, very accurate. Then you get into Vatican II, a very wishy-washy, nebulous, and, and uh, hodgepodge. I'll give you an example to be very brief. Uh, religious liberty, dignitatis humanae. 
uh, was written by Father John Courtney Murray. In the 1950s, he got in trouble for saying what he did because he was contradicting what the Catholic Church taught on religious liberty. He was so subtle in how he wrote this. He talked about one type of liberty, and he jumps to another type of liberty. It is true. Nobody can be forced to become a Catholic. We all know that. You can't force people to be baptized. They have to accept the faith and, and accept you know, the teachings of the church before they can become a Catholic. And you can't force anybody. So he was talking about this and St. Thomas this and whatever about you can't force people to be Catholic. So he's talked about freedom from coercion and he very subtly, subtly slips into freedom to worship God any way you want. And he says, and you have the right to worship God even if you reject the truth and don't accept you know, what God has revealed. You still have the right to publicly teach that. Now, that might sound, you know, in America like, well, that's okay. That's what the American way is. That's why the American way is so messed up. In Catholic countries, such as, example, Spain, Spain was a Catholic country, and their constitution said, if anybody moves to Spain and they're not Catholic, they're not going to be harassed. They can practice their religion privately. But Spain is a Catholic country, and they are not going to proselytize in this Catholic country. You're not going to start getting on the radio or billboards or proselytizing with pamphlets and this and that. It's against the law to do that. You're not going to be allowed to do that. After Vatican II, Spain, Catholic Spain had to change its constitutions and said because of religious liberty, dignitatis humani, all religions have freedom of worship publicly to ex express and promote what their religions are. Fain, Spain then allowed divorce, birth control, uh, pornography and now homosexuality completely went down the drain because of religious liberty same thing down in those countries once Catholic countries in South America the, the bishops of, of down in South America were lamenting they were losing 600,000 Catholics a year to these Protestant groups and that's because religious liberty you know the communists the Masons tried to bring down Spain the Muslims the Sp Spain fought the Muslims the Moors for for centuries they could never conquer Catholic Spain, but Vatican II did it with, from within because, oh, it's, that's the authority. We've got to obey, got to obey the Pope. Uh, same thing with ecumenism. You know, in, in the, the issue of ecumenism, it says this. Ecumenism depends on two principles. The first principle is unity in the church. The second principle, a sharing of graces. Because of the first principle, expressing unity in the church, Ecumenism is to be always, almost always forbidden, but the needed grace recommends it. So, you know, don't do it indiscriminately, but go ahead and do it anyway. That's all they needed to say. You know, you read this thing, what are they saying? They're saying, go ahead. And from that, it just, it's been downhill ever since with worshiping with other churches, other religions. Uh, and and this, is, this is by no means uh, limited to the United States. It's worldwide. There is a, a website, I don't know if any of you have seen this before and if anyone knows the exact name of it, but it was 499 pictures of Novus Ordos. How many have ever seen that before? 499 pictures of Novus Ordos? In Novus Ordo Masses. We, we showed it in Omaha to the students, and we burned them out. The kids are like, this is crazy. This, this is totally weird. These are pictures of Novus Ordos throughout the world, and it would be well worth... Uh, getting these and just displaying them because it is so bizarre. I, I found it just like Novus Ordo so if you Google sacrilegious masses of Novus Ordo, hundreds of, pictures. hundreds of pictures, and I'll just warn you this, some of those pictures are really, really immodest, preposterous. Uh, and, 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 and that's where our Lord's words, when you see the abomination standing in the holy place, let him who reads understand. These Novus Ordos, so many of them are ridiculous. Balloon masses, clown masses, people dressed up in, like, Halloween, and they're up there right in the sanctuary. The priest is dressed up. They're gay masses. They have the rainbow colors covering over the, the, uh, the, uh, the table. It's, it absolutely boggles your mind. After 499 things, the kids are like, enough, enough. This is totally weird. I have to tell you a real interesting story. Uh, our students in Burlington, Colorado, we took them to uh, some of the churches in western Kansas, beautiful churches, historical monuments now, magnificent altars, beautiful stained glass windows, 
And because they're historical buildings, they can't change anything. So we had this fella who is the historian expert of Western Kansas going to tell us you know, a little bit about the history of the churches and how they took these, uh, sto- these sandstones and they drilled holes and they poured water and in the wintertime it froze and they, they had, each family had to bring so many stones to the church. Beautiful churches. One's in Victoria, Kansas, St. Fidelis. Excellent church. So this man's telling these kids, children, this is going to sound really strange. But many years ago, when the priest offered Mass, he faced the altar and had his back to the people. <laughs> and his kids are like, well, yeah. yeah, that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so when, then one of the mothers went up to him and said, they always go to Latin Mass. They always, they, there's never, the priest never faced the people. He said, oh, okay, okay, yeah. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, children, you know. He says, interesting. Uh, trying to think what, their, what other issues had come up. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Okay, this is, this is an important question. Fraternity of St. Peter. These men wear cassocks, go by father, clean cut, devout, fold their hands, pray the rosary. They look pretty good. But the problem is that in 1968, before the changes of 1969 with the Novus Ordo, in 1968, Paul VI radically changed the form for consecrating bishops. In England, after Henry VIII died, his son Edward VI was very sickly, and Cramner, who was supposed to be the Archbishop of Canterbury, married and also a Lutheran in secret. He wrote up a new common book of worship. And, and, and Cramner changed the consecration of bishops. And he said the form is simply receive the Holy Spirit. Pope Leo XIII declared in Apostolic Curie, Anglicans do not have valid orders. That is not a valid form. It expresses none of the powers and graces in, that are given in the form that need to be expressing the consecration of a bishop. Okay. Pope Pius XII in uh, Sacramentum Ordinis, he clearly determined what are the form for bishops, priests, and deacons. Imposition of hands, and then the form. He get, clearly delineated what that form was, which expresses the power and graces of the episcopacy. Paul VI changed it to this. Now pour forth upon this thy chosen one the governing spirit. Receive the Holy Ghost. Pour on this chosen one the governing spirit. Does that tell you what powers they get? No. There were some, and this is a real quick point, there were some in the time of Leo XIII were saying, no, Your, Your Holiness, let's, let's look at this this way. Yes, they say receive the Holy Spirit. The Anglicans, the Protestants say receive the Holy Spirit. But the rest of the ceremony surrounding it is trying to say, we're trying to make this guy a, pre, a bishop. So could you say the significatio, the signification, is from what's adjoining the form? Pope Leo XIII said, no, even if you want to try to argue that, everything else has been changed. Their whole concept of the Episcopal see has been changed. But by analogy, baptism. Let's say a priest goes through the whole ceremony. He says everything right about baptism. He's pouring the water, and he botches the form. He, he messes up on ego te baptizo, and omni patri et filia spiritus sancti. If he botches up on that, it doesn't matter what he did before or after. He can be as articulate as possible on all the prayers and exorcisms and anointings and all that. If he messes the form, it's an invalid sacrament. Receive the Holy Spirit, the Anglicans say. And now after Pope Leo XIII declared him invalid, they, right after they realized they had an invalid form, they added a little bit later on for the, for the, uh, you know, for the consecration of a bishop. But by that time it was too late because all the old bishops who were validly consecrated were dead, and all their Anglican orders stemmed from this one single man, and it was invalid. They lost, they lost apostolic succession. Receive the Holy Spirit, now pour forth on this chosen one the governing spirit. But that don't tell you anything. You know, when you give confirmations, you call upon the Holy Spirit. So a lot of different things you can call on the Holy Spirit, but that that form is ambiguous. 
And that's what's derailed the consecration of bishops. That's why we look at an older priest if he's been ordained by a valid bishop according to the traditional rite. But these fraternity of St. Peter, those priests have been ordained with a traditional rite, but the bishops themselves were consecrated with an invalid form of consecration. Very deceitful, extremely clever. Uh, uh, the issue of St. Pius X, those who are consecrated within the Society of St. Pius X are valid priests. Okay, they're ordained. Now, this is our position. We don't say you have to go, and we don't say you can't go. What do I mean by that? If you have families, if there's families and have children, and by going to the Society of St. Pius X and they're giving you an erroneous idea about the papacy, oh, he's the pope, but we, he's a heretic, we have to pray for his conversion, becomes, you know, he believes in the Catholic faith again, and, and more and more the Society of St. Pius X is, is imbibing things of the Novus Ordo whether it's the calendar or the fast or certain things, they're more and more accepting. They, they really abandon the mission that uh, Archbishop Lefebvre had originally uh, tried to establish with them, that they're going to be in opposition to all these changes. Uh, there is uh, also an interesting thing, too. Uh, on the other hand, this issue about the unicum masses. Now, I'm going to say what I think, okay? Whether you agree with it, don't agree with it, I'm just going to say what the CMRI position is, and we've talked about this at great length with our priests. We're not saying that you have to go to an unicum mass, one with these these priests who are mistaken, whether he's the pope or not, and they say his name in the canon. Issue at point is this. Older priests who are validly ordained, these older priests validly ordained, if they're mistaken on this issue of Francis I, Benedict XVI, John Paul II, if they're mistaken on an issue, let's say all of a sudden the light bulb turns on upstairs and they think, oh, he is the, he's not the Pope. He can't be the Pope. When they come to the right position, are they absolved from excommunication? Do they take a profession of faith? Are they have to abjure their error? No. Why? Because they did not knowingly, intentionally, pertinaciously, as canon law says, deny the faith. They were mistaken on this issue, Okay. So if they don't have to take an abjuration of error, profession of faith, be absolved from excommunication, we're basically saying that you know, they weren't heretics. They were mistaken on this point. If you have a valid priest, Catholic priest, and he's offering a Catholic rite, the issue is, if he's mistaken on his issue of the Pope, that doesn't make it a mortal sin for you to go to that Mass if you have nowhere else to go. He's mistaken on that point. Now, some have tried to say, they've tried to come up with, teachings from the past that have no relevance today to what's the situation today. Father Martin Stepanich, old Franciscan priest from Illinois, from Chicago, he wrote on this issue, and he said, it's not a sin, if you have nowhere else to go, to avail yourself of the sacraments from these priests who unfortunately are mistaken about the papacy and what's going on today in the church. He said, it's not a sin. He said, that doesn't mean you can indiscriminately Send your children or do that and whatever. You've got to be careful about those issues. I'm not saying you have to go, but I'm not saying you can't go because I just have to get to the original point. There is no precedent. There's no teachings of the church. There's no laws of the church pertaining to what we're dealing with today. There are none. I remember an article written by Father Chicada called One Grain of Incense. It's called The Unicum Issue. And I, I, I cut through the whole, how many pages it was, and I got right to the issue. The sin of participation. The quote he gives is from a decree of the Congregation of the Propagation of Faith. That decree is talking about heretics. That you can't go to heretics because, and he, you know, dot, 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 because they mention heretics in the canon. Well, we know that. But we already know that Communicatio in Sacris, canon 1258, that we just wrote on the board, written on the board, you can't and you don't associate with heretics. But these men that are Catholics, professing the Catholic faith, mistaken about whether this man's the Pope or not, does that make their mass a mortal sin to go to? I don't believe so. There's, there's, that is not, uh, there's nothing really precedent to show the situation we're in today. So if, if you are in a place where very remote, you would never get to the sacraments, you can avail yourself of a priest who's validly ordained. He's a Catholic. 
and he offers a Catholic right, even though he's mistaken on this point. Uh, that being said, unfortunately, I think it's a danger for families with children going to these, not because of the Mass, it's a valid Mass, it's a Catholic right, but because of what they're saying, you have to be very discreet about that because children can be very confused and you don't want to get mixed up in, in these, these, this confusion about the papacy and their erroneous points about we can obey him, we, do, we, we obey him when he's right, and we disobey him when he's wrong, and we'll take this, we'll leave that, etc. That's not, that's not the church Christ founded. We are not individually popes. If that man's the pope, you obey him. When he decrees in canon law, you follow it. And you should be one with him in faith and morals and everything else. If you can't, then there's a problem there. I, I want I'm, uh, you know, I'm saying this because some people, oh, that's liberal and that's modernism. Hey, CMRI... We were fighting the changes back in 67. And I was a state of a contest back in 72. So, you know, long before there was any priest leaving the Society of St. Pius X or any other groups, there was a Father Ariaga Sainz, a Mexico Jesuit, who was saying Paul VI wasn't the Pope. Along with him was Father Moise Carmona, Father Zamora, uh, Father Bravo, these men that were later consecrated bishops. So there were priests out there. We weren't the first ones. But in the United States, we were prominently saying, this is the apostasy, those men are not the Pope, Vatican II led to the apostasy, the new Mass is no good, etc. So we're not, but I'm just trying to okay, think according to what is the mind of the Church. We need the sacraments, we need especially communion and confession, etc. And if you're in some remote place, let's say in the world, and there's an older priest who's retired offering a Latin Mass, to say you commit a mortal sin by going to that priest, I don't buy that at all. Don't accept that at all. And uh, I know this is a very controversial situation of some that believe that it's a mortal sin, you can't do it. If that's what you think, then don't go. But as far as I'm concerned, the sacraments are for the people. The sacraments are for men. That's how Christ instituted the church. And let us be honest with the situation today. Very confusing. And and people are trying to be Catholic. And I think we should be really careful. Uh, you know, we should be very careful when we try to start making statements that that's a mortal sin, this is a sin, that's heresy, uh, very, very, we're, we're accusing people of this and that, whatever else. It is clear, these modern Vatican II popes are not popes, they're heretics, public heretics, etc. But for some people, they see that, but then again, they're thinking, what about perpetual successors? And what about this? And what about that? What about a declaration? They're confused about those other issues that we have more than amply uh, Answered, I know in the two uh, conferences ago we gave this answering the objections to the city of Vicanta's position. If you want a copy of this, this goes through all the quotes and we cover all the objections. Supposed to be perpetual successors. What about there's no cardinals? Uh, what does that have to be declared? We've answered those questions here. Uh, this is also on our website, cmri.org. Um, any other questions? Yes. No, no. You know, there was an issue that had come up, and there are some who still stick to this. Uh, 1980s, maybe even earlier, late 70s, uh, the issue about the consecrator of Lefebvre, Oculé Leonard, it was believed that there was a picture of him in full Masonic regalia, that he was dressed like a Mason, high-ranking Mason to boot. So they said, oh, don't worry about it, because when they consecrate bishops, there's two other co-consecrators. Then they realize, Ocule Leonard ordained him a priest. If you're not a priest, you can't become a bishop. And when I, before I consecrated Bishop Dolan in 1993, I knew that this issue was going to come up. And so I, I wrote a letter, public letter, saying, what is the mind of the church? Pope Leo XIII and also St. Thomas Aquinas say, if someone externally carefully follows the right of the church, the presumption is he has the intention to do what the church intends. And if you try to go contrary to that, we would never prove anybody because the church has been going on for nearly 2,000 years. Don't tell me that Oculi Leonard may have been the only Mason out there. How do we know there's another, other Masons? We only know from what's external. We can't judge what's in someone's head, but if somebody follows the right of the church, we have to presume they had the right intention, unless you can prove otherwise. 
So that's, that's not a problem with, with ordinations and confirmations and such like things. We were way over time. Father is hounding me right now. So <laughs> let's go ahead and stand for the Angelus.